Hello, my name is Flavio Toxver. I'd like to thank the organizers for including me in the program. So I'd like to talk to you about a set of materials that I developed for courses that I've been teaching uh, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, these were two courses in particular, namely uh, industrial organization uh, for graduate students and an undergraduate course uh, also in industrial organization theory. Uh, the courses uh, are um, basically with an emphasis on theoretical analysis uh, and I go through the all the standard models of industrial organization uh, and oligopoly theory. Uh, the typical uh, presentation will be first model presentation and then uh, I go through how the model is solved. Then I do typically comparative statics analysis, uh, interpretation, and then uh, typically a case or two to put uh, all the analysis into context. And of course, uh, emphasis with an emphasis also on uh, policy relevance and what we can do uh, to uh, to improve the functioning of markets uh, that we've been looking at. Uh, now, for all these steps, of course, mathematical derivation is uh, is relied on quite heavily. Uh, and to develop intuition, I typically supplement the mathematical analysis with uh, some kind of graph or illustration. Now, uh, as most people in, in this area, uh, you know, I've been typically relying either on handmade graphs on the on the whiteboard uh, that and change uh, these uh, according to need, or uh, sometimes I've also uh, either relied on graphs uh, made available through the uh, publishers of textbooks or sometimes made some myself through uh, PowerPoint or other such software. Now, at some point, I realized that uh, there, there might be a better way to do this, uh, and that uh, made me um, develop a set of interactive graphs through Mathematica that I was using anyway for my own research. Um, and so they, this became a project, and this was funded through the uh, University of Cambridge's Teaching and Learning Innovation Fund and was uh, done with the help of a graduate student called Jakob Bernd. So um, these materials, and I'm going to show you the details in a moment, I used them for three different purposes. First, I used them uh, instead of graphs during my own uh, lectures. Um, that is, I used them instead of the static graphs that, that uh, I used to use uh, beforehand. I also make these uh, materials available to the students and facilitate uh, experimentation of self-study uh, via a set of uh, dedicated materials that I've produced alongside uh, these interactive graphs. And last, I've made also these materials available uh, to colleagues, uh, both at Cambridge and elsewhere. Uh, and there's a website where all the code uh, is available for anyone who uh, is interested. And this site, uh, the, the website will be, uh, will be indicated at the end of this talk, but also uh, at, uh, alongside the, the posting on the website of this conference. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna give you uh, examples of the graphs and how they work, uh, just give you a little bit of an insight of how they are created. And then I'm going to show you a little bit of the uh, material that I've, uh, that I've developed alongside these uh, interactive graphs and give you a little bit uh, of sense of the, uh, how these uh, materials were received by students themselves. Uh, and so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this is a typical set of, of, uh, of uh, illustrations that were provided by the uh, publisher of a particular graduate step, uh, level textbook uh, in I.O. Um, this is an illustration of the Salop City uh, created in PowerPoint. Uh, this has a number of subgraphs, so you can click through uh, the different subgraphs and see how things change a little bit. But the underlying nature of the model is still uh, fixed in these graphs because there's no there are no formulae that actually generate these graphs. These are just graphical illustrations of the graphs themselves. Uh, here we have uh, another illustration uh, of the typical graphs uh, that people use in the field. Uh, in this case, it's a uh, vertical mergers. So this is uh, kind of the, the, the kind of, of materials that I used to use beforehand. Uh, so this is a good segue to, uh, to switch uh, and to look a little bit at the interactive graphs themselves. So I'm going to switch here. Um, okay, so the first one I want to show you is, is, is a very simple one. Again, this is the circular city of Salop. Uh, in this case, there are three firms, one, two, and three, and I've indicated the market shares of the three firms by different, three different colors. So blue for firm one, green for firm two, and red for firm three. On the left-hand side here, we have a number of sliders, and these sliders correspond to the prices that the two firms set on the different market segments. 
So I allow, for example, firm one to set a different price on the market to the left and the market to the right. That's just for generality. And so we can see, for example, we can change the price here in the, on the slider, and then we can see how the market shares of the two firms change, okay? And as one would expect, when you increase the price that firm one sets, then its market share in this market segment, of course, decreases. I've also uh, put this uh, pointer here, uh, which is the red dot, and I can use that to basically illustrate uh, where they, I want the students to look. So for example, I can say, at this point between the firm one and firm two, the uh, consumer is indifferent. Whereas if we move uh, a little bit in this direction, the firm, sorry, the consumer is no longer indifferent. And so you can see that uh, I can then change all the different sliders independently. And, uh, and I can then talk people through this diagram um, in this way. So this is a very simple example. Let's go to a more complicated example. So this is a, uh, an example of a, um, of a more complicated setting. This is mergers in Corno oligopoly uh, with and without synergies. So this graph illustrates uh, the so-called merger paradox, the idea that firms, when they merge, unless there is uh, synergies, uh, that may uh, actually create a situation where the insiders uh, don't benefit from the merger, but the outsiders do benefit from the merger. And so what these curves show are basically the best response functions, the aggregate best response functions of the outsider firms and on the insider firms before and after the merger takes place. And what this allows me to do is allows me to basically compare the profits before and after the merger for insider firms and for outsider firms as a function of a number of different things so that we can see up here in the panel. So A and B are basically the uh, intercept, and, intercept and slope of the, uh, of the linear demand function. So we could change those and see how that changes the diagram. We can also change the marginal costs of the firms before merger happens. We can change the number of firms in the industry. So that's N. Uh, so we can change that uh, as, as we wish. And we can also change uh, the number of firms that become insiders. So that is the number of firms that decide to, uh, to participate in the merger itself so that we can change uh, at will here. And then uh, what we can do is we can change also the uh, amount of synergies that the merging firms have in terms of marginal cost. So this is a, this S, a larger S corresponds to higher synergies. And we can then show how uh, changing synergies actually don't just create a pivot of the best response function of the insiders, it actually shifts it uh, as well, uh, which is, something you can see up here, okay? And, and you might have noticed that uh, when I change the different things in the diagram here, uh, everything is interactive. That is the tick marks that show the equilibrium before and after the merger, all of them uh, change as does the ISO profit curves that go through uh, the uh, post and pre-merger uh, equilibrium uh, points. So that's the merger paradox. This next one is, uh, is, is a very particularly useful uh, example uh, of how you can do multiple interlinked graphs. So this particular uh, graph illustrates um, the uh, issue of vertical uh, integration and double marginalization. So here we have basically a downstream firm that faces final consumers. Uh, that's the blue downward sloping uh, inverse demand function we have the firm's marginal revenue curve, and then we have a, a horizontal dotted line which corresponds to the marginal cost of the downstream firm. You'll note that this is denoted by W, which is the wholesale price that is set by the upstream firm. And the upstream firm's problem is then illustrated in the upper panel. So what, we, what I typically will do is I will explain to the students that, uh, from the perspective of the downstream firm, the wholesale price that it faces is essentially its marginal cost function um, curve. And so it will set its output uh, to final consumers so that marginal revenue equals to marginal cost. And that will give us the downstream uh, price PD to final consumers. Now, what I will then do is I will go up here and I will try to determine how does the upstream firm determine the wholesale price W and it will do that by setting its marginal revenue curve equal to its marginal cost. Now, its marginal cost, of course, is C, 
uh, which we can see by varying C, okay? And what it will do is it will say, well, if my marginal uh, cost is C, I will have to equalize that to my marginal uh, revenue curve. Now, the marginal revenue curve, of course, is derived from its induced uh, demand function, which is in turn de de determined by the marginal revenue curve of the downstream firm. So I will point out to the students that the marginal revenue curve for the downstream firm actually becomes the demand function of the upstream firm. And so therefore it's derived marginal revenue curve has double slope. So you can see here that going from the original demand function uh, that is that of the final consumers, we get to that of the upstream firm and its marginal revenue curve in principle would become the, the demand function of, a, of another firm at, at one level above, okay? And so once we've recognized that the marginal cost curve uh, and the marginal revenue curve is equal here for the upstream firm, then uh, it will set its wholesale price so that, um, so that those two are exactly equal to each other, which happens here. And we can see here on the, on the y-axis that happens to coincide with the monopoly price that would be uh, uh, set if there were, uh, if there were, were just one uh, level of production, okay? And once we've set that, we can go down here and say, well, given that the marginal, uh, sorry, that the wholesale price is given at that level, the final price of the downstream firm will be PD. And now we can read off the double marginalization directly on the graph because the one margin is the difference between the wholesale price and the true marginal cost C. And the second margin is the difference between the downstream firm's final price to consumers PD and the uh, wholesale price. So we can see double marginalization directly off of this graph. And as you can see that everything here is interactive so we can change the demand and cost parameters uh, at will. The next example I want to show you uh, is, um, is to uh, illustrate how to show um, uh, uh, Stackelberg equilibrium, the value of commitment, and how to relate it to the Cournot equilibrium case. So we start by showing the best response functions of uh, two symmetric Cournot competitors with constant marginal costs. Uh, the equilibrium point, of course, is the intersection uh, of the two best response functions. And what I will then say is, well, uh, in, which, in which directions do, do the profits increase? And I can do that uh, by showing the ISO profit curves of the two firms. And I will then tell the students that from the perspective of firm uh, one or I, which is the one whose quantity is on the X axis, the best possible of all outcomes is the one where it sets monopoly output and the other one sets zero output. And I will then illustrate that by showing that profits increase down in that direction. Okay, so once I've shown them that, they realize that the closer they get down to this point, the higher the profits will be for firm I. And similarly, I could do something for firm J, which is in the other direction. Now, once I've shown them that, I will then say, well, if, if the first mover moves first, essentially what it's doing, it is choosing points on the best response function of the follower, okay? Uh, and I've, I have already derived all this mathematically, but I can then show them that the first mover can choose any point along the blue uh, curve because these are all the best responses of the second mover. Now, the, the last bit of, of analysis is really to convince the students that doing so is actually better than staying at the original Corno point. And that of course is very clear once we put the isoprofit curves because the isoprofit curve that goes through the original point, the Corno point is at a higher point. That is, it is further away from the most desired point than the uh, ones that goes through the um, Stackelberg equilibrium point, which is given by this point here. And I also point out that this is the point at which there's a point of tangency between the isoprofit curve and the best response function of the second mover, okay? And so that becomes very clear. And I can also show by reference to the isoprofit curves of the second firm that in this case, the second firm is actually worse off. So there's a second mover disadvantage here. And last, what I can also say is that rather than focusing on first and second movers, we can think of that as any model 
in which the first mover can credibly commit to uh, push its best response function outwards. And I do that by showing basically uh, the best response function here, uh, which is, uh, would be equivalent, um, would we achieve the same thing as the, um, as the Stackelberg first mover uh, outcome. Okay, let me just run through uh, one or two graphs more, and then I will end uh, showing you a little bit of the, uh, of the feedback. This is an example of Hotelling's linear city. Uh, again, here I've allowed for both uh, horizontal differentiation and vertical differentiation. So what these graphs show is the utility of a consumer buying from one or the other firm as a function of his or her uh, location. We can then change, for example, the vertical horizontal uh, differentiation component of the two firms. Uh, I can also change the prices of the two firms. And we can see that when I change the prices, the location of the indifferent consumer, which I've denoted by XM, uh, it switches around uh, all the time. I can also change, for example, I can change the transport costs and show what, what that does. Uh, if the transport co cost is sufficiently high, then of course uh, we end up with two local monopolists and these people in the middle don't buy from anyone. Uh, and I can also show what happens if we change the locations of the two firms, or indeed, if we were to change the density of the consumers uh, in the market, um, and you can see how that changes here. So these are basically the standard setup uh, of the hoteling model. And then I can also show what happens in terms of best response functions. Again, uh, we can show what happens if you have vertical differentiation, as well as horizontal differentiation. We get asymmetric outcomes. Uh, I can change the costs of the two firms. Again, we move away from the, um, from the, uh, the 45 degree line because we have asymmetric costs. And then I can also say what happens if we change the transport costs uh, in, this, in this setting. Okay, so this is just a, a, a very quick run through of the different possibilities we can, uh, we can look at. Let me just go back very quickly uh, to the uh, other set of slides. So the, the feedback I got from students was overwhelmingly positive. So this is uh, for the graduate students. I asked them, uh, did, did they find it useful for me to use those during the lectures to explain the material? Uh, one means strongly disagree and five means strongly agree. So this was uh, anonymous um, uh, feedback that I elicited through uh, SurveyMonkey. And we can see the overwhelmingly students have, have liked the experience. Uh, the second one is basically how useful was it for self-study. Uh, and also here, people seem to have been uh, quite happy with the materials. This particular one was for the graduate course and for the undergraduate course, it looks very similar. Um, uh, and the last, I also asked them whether they would like there to be more of this material. And again, most people actually uh, very much supported that idea. So let me uh, just end by showing you um, the site. So on this website uh, on the internet, I've made all these materials available. You can go in there and you can download uh, the code in two different formats. If you don't have a mathematical license, you can use something called Wolfram Player, which is a little bit like a, you know, Adobe Acrobat. It's, it's free to, to have the reader, but if you want to actually change the code yourself, then you need the Mathematica software itself. So the CDF format is if you just want to play around with it without changing it. If you want to actually change the Mathematica code for your own purposes, then you need the Mathematica code itself uh, and you need a Mathematica license, but all the codes are made available. Uh, and uh, should you have any uh, questions, uh, you're more than welcome to contact me. Otherwise, uh, please do make use of this material if you find it useful. And uh, I hope... Uh, others can benefit from, from, these, uh, from these teaching materials. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.